And then we will speak about the anomalies of the thyroid development. And we will start by the first anomaly, which may be a genesis of the gland or hypoplasia of the gland. And this eventually results in hypothyroidism, which is congenital, may lead to cretinism. And then there may be an absent loop. And then anomalies of the thyroglossal duct. And the first anomaly of the thyroglossal duct is the ectopic thyroid gland. And the ectopic thyroid gland may be present in the foramen cecum. So it will be a swelling or differential diagnosis of swelling at the base of the tongue. And we may use a thyroid scan to diagnose and never to excise this swelling because it, it will be the only functioning thyroid tissue. So not every swelling to be excised this is one of the swelling, don't excise. Uh, this is about the uh, ectopic thyroid present at the base of the tongue. It may be elsewhere in the neck as seen in this photo and the diagnosis depends on thyroid scan. And then we will speak about the anomalies of the thyroglossal duct, the thyroglossal cyst and thyroglossal sinus or fistula. The thyroglossal cyst is a type of tubular dermoid, exactly like the branchial cyst, type of tubular dermoid. It is uh, lined by squamous epithelium and it enters in differential diagnosis of midline neck swelling. And because it is lined by squamous epithelium, it may be liable for recurrent infection and the recurrent infection will result in the uh, sinus or fistula formation. And in 1%, it may turn malignant, and malignancy may be in the form of papillary thyroid carcinoma or squamous cell carcinoma, but it is just 1%. Uh, this swelling, which is the thyroglossal cyst, uh, is characterized by movement up and down with tongue protrusion. Movement up and down with tongue protrusion. The diagnosis depends on, on ultrasound, ultrasound will reveal its cystic nature and the treatment is by what we call cyst trunk operation treatment by cyst trunk operation and we will show you a short video about cyst trunk operation which depends on excision of the whole cyst together with the tack so to remove the tack we must remove the central part of the hyoid bone the central part of the hyoid bone is traversed by the tack and we will follow the tack up to the foramen cecum. So it is called cyst trunk operation, excision of the cyst with the central part of the hyoid with the whole tract, otherwise recurrence will occur. And cyst trunk operation is the treatment of the thyroglossal cyst and the thyroglossal sinus and fistula. What about the nerves related to the thyroid? This is a very good photo, very good photo showing many structures showing there is the inferior thyroid artery you can see the inferior thyroid artery going to the posteromedial part supplying both the parathyroid glands giving branches to the trachea giving branches to the pharynx and the esophagus again the uh, superior laryngeal nerve gives internal laryngeal nerve which is a sensory nerve supplying the upper part of the larynx while the lower part of the larynx is supplied by the sensory branches of the recurrent laryngeal nerve and there is external laryngeal nerve which supplies the cricothyroid muscle while the other muscles all the other muscles of the larynx are supplied by the recurrent laryngeal nerve so we can say that all muscles of the larynx are supplied by the recurrent laryngeal nerve except the cricothyroid muscle which is supplied by the external laryngeal nerve in this photo the recurrent laryngeal nerve on the right side differs from the recurrent laryngeal nerve on the left side. On the right side, it is turning around the preacuencephalic artery, and in the left side, it is turning around the ductus uh, arteriosus, ductus between the aorta and the pulmonary arteries. It is deeper in its loop while on the right side it is turning around the preacuencephalic artery this is the recurrent laryngeal nerve and it sinks under the peres ligament to enter the larynx the external laryngeal nerve is supplying the uh, cricothyroid muscle what is the function of this muscle 
The function of this muscle, it is responsible for the uh, cord tensing to make the cord more tense. It is responsible for the high pitched sound and cutting or injury to the external laryngeal nerve produces redundancy of the cord and loss of high pitched sound. Loss of high pitched sound. To avoid injury of this important nerve, we try to ligate the superior uh, thyroid artery as close as possible to the upper pool of the gland to avoid injury of this nerve. So as we see in this photo, we ligate the superior thyroid artery close to the gland as close as possible to the superior pool of the gland. Otherwise, injury of this nerve is uh, responsible for loss of high pitched sound due to paralysis of the cricothyroid muscle, uh, which is responsible for cord tensing. What about the recurrent laryngeal nerve? It is sensory for the lower part of the larynx, motor to, to all the other muscles of the vocal cord. Other muscles are either abductors or adductors of the vocal cord. What about the relations of this nerve to the inferior thyroid artery? Usually the nerve either comes in between the branches of the uh, inferior thyroid artery or totally under the branches of the inferior thyroid artery and to avoid injury of this nerve usually it is preferable to ligate the terminal fine branches of the inferior thyroid artery in the past we were advised to ligate the uh, inferior thyroid artery away from the gland but actually ligation here will produce ischemia or ischemic injury to the uh, uh, parathyroid gland and we will get tetany due to ischemic injury. So recently don't ligate the inferior thyroid artery away from the gland but ligate the inferior thyroid artery as close as possible to the gland, ligate the fine terminal branches. Speaking about the effect of injury of the recurrent laryngeal nerve, we can imagine the uh, recurrent laryngeal nerve with the arrangement of fibers. احنا بنقول ان outer fibers هم اللي هم abductors fibers دول اللي هم outer fibers abductors بينما adductors هم الموجودين inner layer وبنقول ان the effect of injury may be partial زي ما احنا شايفين كده او complete او complete injury واضح طبعا فبالتالي هنقسمه الى partial و complete زي ما احنا شايفين partial و ايه و complete طيب البارشل متوقع يأفكت ايه البارشل مؤكد انه هيأفكت الاوتر اللي هما الاب داكتورز فقط يبقى هيبقوا لوست عندي اللي هما الاب داكتورز وبالتالي ده هيديني unopposed unopposed ad داكتورز ad داكتورز يبقى unopposed Adductors. بينما الكومبليت طبعا لوست بوث لوست بوث يديني كادافيريك بوزيشن الكور ده هيبقى كادافيريك بوزيشن لا هو ادكتد ولا هو اب ادكتد في النص كده في النص طيب كل واحده منهم نقدر نقسمها الى يونيلاترال وبايلاترال على ناحيه واحده او على الناحيتين وده طبعا لسوء الحظ على الناحيتين يبقى يونيلاترال وبايلاترال كل واحده منهم يونيلاترال او بايلاترال نيجي لليونيلاترال وبارشيال يبقى الابدكتورز هيبقوا لوست على ناحيه واحده وان اوبوزد ادكشن طبعا هنلاقي الكورد على ناحيه كومبليتلي ادكت بهذا الشكل بينما الثانيه ستيل وركينج ستيل وركينج هنا على طول يحصل ديسنيا اون انسبيريشن هي افكت الانسبيريشن تحصل ديسنيا طب لو بايلاترال الكورد هيبقى ادكتد على الناحيتين في اثناء الانسبيريشن دي كارثه يحصل على طول سترايدر وطبعا السترايدر ده ايمرجنسي محتاج على طول ايرجنت تراكيوستومي او ايمرجنت تراكيوستومي تراكيوستومي تو سولف ذا بروبلم طب في في الناحيه الثانيه بقى الكومبليت هيبقى كذا فيرك بوزيشن لو هو يوني لاترال هيبقى كذا فيرك بوزيشن على وان سايد اونلي ده هيافكت الاكسبيريشن لان الفونيشن بيحصل اثناء الاكسبيريشن pushing the air على ناحية واحدة يحصل just hoarseness of voice لأن ناحية الناحية الثانية still working فيعمل hoarseness of voice لو على ناحية واحدة طيب لو على الناحيتين الكور ده هيبقى immobile وكذافيرك على الناحيتين of course أفونيا على طول يحصل إيه complete أفونيا 
او لوست فويس من هنا يتضح لنا التقسيمه يتضح لنا ان البارشيال هيافكت الانسبيريشن بينما الكومبليت هيافكت الاكسبيريشن او الفونيشن البارشيال هيافكت الريسبيريشن ده في اثناء الانسبيريشن بينما الكومبليت هيافكت الفونيشن اللي هو بيحصل اثناء الاكسبيريشن Speaking about the physiology, the process starts by iodine trapping from the GIT into the uh, thyroid follicle. This is the follicle, and this may be blocked by thiocyanate. And then the iodine, iodine is transformed into iodide by oxidization process or oxidizing enzyme, which is blocked by thiouracil, and then the iodide is transformed into the thyroglobulin and this may be blocked by other antithyroid drugs. The iodide is combined with amino acid tyrosine to form mono and diiodotyrosine and then the coupling process one mono plus one di to produce triiodothyronine which is T3 or two diiodo tyrosine to be coupled into T4 which is uh, tetraiodothyronine which is T4 or thyroxin and both T3 and T4 may be trapped again into the circulation by proteolytic enzymes from the colloid from the colloid into the circulation to produce T3 and T4 they are transported by thyroid binding globulin TBG into the cells to produce the basal metabolic rate and to produce energy and final degradation through the liver and the kidney. And of course, there is what we call peripheral conversion from T4 into T3 in the peripheral tissues. It is called the peripheral conversion and some of the antithyroid drugs can block also this peripheral conversion. Lastly, there is a what we call feedback mechanism. The hypothalamus release TRH and the TRH stimulates the pituitary to release the TSH thyroid stimulating hormone and there is a feedback mechanism between free T4 and free T3 feedback mechanism when they are elevated there is suppression of the hypothalamus and the pituitary when they are lowered there is a stimulation of TRH and TSH to, to increase the gland uh, uh, vascularity and secretion as a feedback mechanism